Job chapter 42, I would like to read the last recorded words that the scriptures give us that Job ever says. Now, I know this isn't the last thing that Job ever says. Job lives after this for 140 years. No doubt he says a whole lot more. But the last thing that the Holy Ghost gives us that Job says in recorded scripture is found in verse number 6 of chapter 42. And I would like to submit to you tonight, this is kind of an odd thing for Job to break off his narrative in saying. Job 42 verse 6, if you found your place, say amen. amen. Job said, Wherefore I abhor myself. I hate myself. How's that for a day of positive affirmation? How's that for a day of love yourself? Think a lot of yourself. You're wonderful. You're great. You're somebody. Job says, I hate myself. <laughs> I think the key to enjoying life and enjoying the Lord and enjoying living for God more is probably think less of yourself, not more of yourself. Amen, amen. You wonder why there's so many miserable Christians. It's because we have too high an estimation of ourselves tonight. Job said, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Now I thought to myself, Preacher Foster, that's kind of an odd thing for a man the caliber of Job to say. It would not be an odd thing for a man the caliber of Cody Zorn to say, I got a lot to repent over. I got a lot of problems. If you knew how messed up I was, you'd say you're exactly right. You got a lot to get right over. But here we find that the Bible doesn't seem to indicate that Job is such a man, Brother Christian, where he would need to say words like, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. This is the last thing the Bible's ever going to give us that Job's says, a statement of self-loathing, a statement of self-lowliness. I repent in dust and in ashes. I'm, I mean, you realize what the Bible says about Job. The Holy Ghost's own record of Job in Job chapter 1 verse 1 is this. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. The same was a perfect man and an upright man, one that feared God and eschewed evil. Now we realize when the Bible says perfect, when you take into consideration the whole of Scripture, the Bible's not saying that Job never sinned. The Bible's not saying that Job never had any unrighteousness in him. The Bible's simply saying he's a whole man. He's a complete man. He's not leaving anything out. But he's an upright man. He walks uprightly. He doesn't walk crookedly. He doesn't walk in a deceit. He's an upright man. He's a righteous man. He fears God and he tries to stay away from evil. He wants it away from him. And can I say, that's not just the record of Scripture. That's the record of God himself. Because the Lord shows up later on in chapter 1 and the devil shows up too. And the Lord says, where have you been at, Satan? He said, I've been walking to and fro in the earth. I've been walking up and down in it. And the Lord said, hey, have you considered my servant Job? There ain't nobody like him in the earth. He's a perfect man. He's an upright man. Man. He's one that fears God and eschews evil. Now listen to me. It's one thing for somebody to say that about you. It's one thing for somebody like Eliphaz that wrote the book to say that about you. It's Elihu, excuse me, but it's a whole other thing for the God of heaven to look at you and say, that man is a perfect man. He fears me and he eschews evil. I'd say that's a high, high caliber individual tonight. And yet the last thing we find that Job says, the perfect man, the upright man, the one that fears God, the one that eschews evil, is he says, I hate myself. I repent in dust and in ashes. You know what kind of caliber that Job is tonight when we get all the way to the book of Ezekiel? The Bible says, said in the book of Ezekiel in chapter 14 the Lord gets to talking about he's 
threatening judgment and brother Jeff he's going to bring judgment down on the nation and he said there's three men that if they was there uh, maybe things would be different and he named three men he named Noah he named Daniel and he named Job he puts Job in the same classification as a man like Noah a man who found grace in the eyes of the Lord a man who built a boat to the saving of his house he puts him in the classification of a man like Daniel a man who purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat a man like Daniel who lived for God in spite of terrible circumstances in spite of captivity in spite of bondage and yet Daniel just lives for God in a consistent way and right in the middle of Noah and Daniel the Lord throws in the name Job this guy is in high cotton tonight would you agree with me but how many of you know this how many of you know this how many of you know that even the best of men are still men at best even the best of men are still flesh and blood and they're still men at best Noah was a great man but Noah got drunk I don't blame him <laughs> after all them days on board that ark with three daughters all's a wife and a messed up son and all them animals I'd have probably got drunk too somebody say amen right there can't blame him too much we find that Abraham's the father of faith but Abraham lies about Sarah being his wife Abraham gets ahead of God takes Hagar when he shouldn't have and, and had Ishmael out of that relationship that he shouldn't have Joseph shouldn't have been alone as wise as he was Joseph shouldn't have been alone in the house with Potiphar's wife Moses lost his temper killed a man Moses lost his temper broke all the ten commandments at one time Moses lost his temper smacked the rock when he should have spoke to the rock Samuel didn't raise his sons right in spite of how good he was David ended up sinning in the matter of Bathsheba and numbering the people Jeremiah threw the towel in and wanted to quit. Peter, one of the apostles, cursed and denied the Lord. Paul didn't listen to the warnings of the Holy Ghost about not going to Jerusalem and we find even the greatest men of Scripture have flaws and faults and failures in their life. As a matter of fact, the apostle John who writes four, five, excuse me, uh, books in the New Testament, the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and the Revelation, even John the Beloved himself said this if we say we have no sin John throwing himself in with the rest of us John said if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us the Bible said there's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not now hang with me I'm headed somewhere I know your mind's been like where are we headed with this and I'm about to bring this to a point in just a minute can I just say this at the onset though there was only one man that walked the face of God's green earth that was a totally perfect man with no sin the God man the son of God the Lord Jesus Christ there was no sin in him the only sin he had was my sin and it was like on him and he took it to the top of Calvary outside of that there's never been a man that did not just have sin on him but sin in him tonight and you say well if Job is such a great man if Job's a man that's perfect upright fears God and eschews evil what is Job's such great sin what's his so great a transgression that he would get to the end of the book after all he's been through <laughs> and say, man, I hate myself. We always hear Job preached about almost like he's been done wrong. Right? Very, very few times do you ever hear any preacher ever highlight that Job ever had an issue, Brother Phil, in his life. There was times that I wondered to myself, Lord, why when you showed up? Because listen to me, when the Lord finally shows up in Job's life, I think to myself a man who has ended up losing all of his ten of his kids all of his friends turned against him lost all of his wealth lost all of his monetary possessions his wife said curse God and die I almost think that when God finally shows up on the scene over there in chapter 37 or 38 that God would show up and say Job I'm so sorry you've had a rough life it's been tough 
but here I, I'm here to I'm here to cry on my shoulder. But that ain't it at all. When God shows up, He doesn't give Job a shoulder to cry on. He lamb blasts Job. I mean, brother, he shows up and starts firing away at Job. He doesn't give Job a place of respite. He doesn't give Job a place of relief. Instead, he brings Job to a place of repentance. And I thought, how, how is this possible? After everything Job's been through, a perfect man upright, how is this possible? And the Holy Ghost spoke to my heart like this. Can I tell you that Job's sin is a subtle one that even the greatest of Christian men and Christian women can harbor in our own life, overlook and not even realize that we have harbored it in our hearts until the Lord starts working in our life like he does Job's. Would you look at chapter 32 with me? Watch the subtlety of the sin that's in Job's life. Job chapter 32. Watch the first two verses of Job 32. Hang with me. I'm fixing to give you my title. Throw my three little points out, and we're going to go eat something. Say amen right there. Praise God. Job 32, verse number 1. So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu, that's the author of the book, obviously the Holy Ghost inspires it, but he's the human penman. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzite of the kindred of Ram against Job, was his wrath kindled because he justified himself rather than God. I want y'all to hear me. Don't miss this. You'll miss the whole message tonight. The last chapter in your Bible that Job defends himself is in chapter 31, right prior to what we've just read. Job speaks for all 40 verses in Job chapter 31. It's the last chapter he's going to defend himself. After this, Job's not going to defend himself anymore. Job has been, I mean, brother, from chapter 2 all the way to chapter 31. Job will defend himself and then his friends will shoot at him. And Job will defend himself and his friends will shoot at him. And chapter 31 is Job's final masterpiece. It's his final defense that he puts forth. It's his final argument about how bad he's been done. And listen to me, listen to me. In the 40 verses of chapter 31 in Job's closing arguments, he says the word I 27 times. He says the word my 31 times. He says the word me 13 times. He says the word mine 12 times. Y'all listen to me. He uses, don't miss this, he uses 83 personal possessive pronouns in 40 verses. That's better than two personal possessive pronouns per verse. When you read chapter 31, you know what you read? You read and it reeks of the stench of a man who is self-righteous. I have done this and I have done that and my stuff I gave to this person and I didn't withhold what was mine from this individual and all you read for 31 verses is a man who is saying me, mine, I, mine, me, mine, I. It is all about self tonight. Now won't y'all listen to me? When you read chapter 31, everything that Job says that he has been doing and hasn't been doing are things that we all should and should not do as well. Job says in chapter 31, when somebody was down and out, I tried to help them. You ought to help your brothers and sisters in the Lord. Do good unto all men, especially they of the household of faith. Job said, I haven't went and laid with my neighbor's wife. That's good. You ought not to be committing adultery with your neighbor's wife living in fornication and wicked immorality. But y'all listen to me. The problem becomes when you get self-righteous about it, when you get prideful about it, and you say, I've been doing this, and I've been doing that, and I've been doing the other, and I'm telling you what I've been doing. I'm living for God. 
and I've been giving and I've been tithing and I've been showing up and I've been working and I've been serving I'm telling you even the greatest of Christians can have self-righteousness seep into their life y'all listen to me tonight I'm an independent fundamental premillennial King James Bible believe in walk right talk right don't cuss drink chew and run with them that do ha Baptist this evening unapologetically unashamed I know what I believe I know why I believe it I ain't backing up from it I ain't changing for you nor ten more just like you but there is a danger in our movement of getting to the place where we let all the things that we do and the things we don't do become something that we allow to make us self-righteous Listen to me tonight. A disclaimer, listen to me. God's people are supposed to be a righteous people. Don't get in the other ditch. Don't fall in the contemporary left-wing ditch where you say, well, it, just live any way you want. Do whatever you want. You know, be as liberal as the devil so that way you don't look self-righteous. No, I, I, I'm not going that ditch either. But I ain't going to fall in the ditch on the other side. The Bible tells me I'm supposed to live a righteous life before the Lord. The Bible said in Romans chapter 6 being made free from sin ye became the servants of righteousness the Bible said for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink but righteousness peace and joy in the Holy Ghost the Bible said awake to righteousness and sin not the Bible said be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion hath light with darkness the Bible said put on the new man which is after God created in righteousness and true holiness the Bible said thou man of God flee these things and follow after righteousness Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, and patience. The Bible said if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. The Bible said about the grace of God, that the grace of God teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. I believe God's people need to make a return to righteousness. I believe God's people need to make a return to holiness. I believe God's people need to get more conscious today about what we listen to and about what we wear and about what we watch and about what we say and about where we go and about who we hang out with and about what we spend our time and our efforts and our money on. But listen to me. Along with all of those things, I don't want to become a Pharisee to where I do things to be seen of men, where I do things to get glory and a pat on the back. You say, preacher, why do you try and live holy? Why do you try and live righteously? Why do you try and hang around the right people? Why do you try and listen to the right music? Why do you try and wear the right clothes? Why do you believe in all? Because I want to be right with God. It's not about being right with anybody else. It's about being right before the Lord. I want the Lord to be pleased with me. I want the Lord to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I'm not in this so that you can say, look at Cody's horn. I'm not in this so that the world can say, ain't he a great Christian? I want to hear the Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to be found accepted in him. And I don't want to be self-righteous. I I want to be conscious of this because I want to be righteous before God. And I want to preach for just a few minutes tonight on this subject, the sin of self-righteousness. The sin, and it's Job's life. It's the sin of Job. I don't know how many of you have read the book of Job. I'm sure many of you Christians have read it over and over. And if you're like me, you can read those 42 chapters and come to the place where you're like, Job's not done anything. But when you start looking at Job's life, you find it's that little subtle sin that he's become self-righteous about all he does and all he doesn't do. Would you hear me tonight? And Would you, would you remember this statement that I'm about to tell you? We can be spiritually righteous without being self-righteous. You're commanded to be spiritually righteous. You're commanded to be a holy people, a peculiar people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a holy priesthood. You're commanded to be that. You can't read the New Testament epistles to the church and come away not believing that you are, you're not supposed to look like this world. Sister, you're not supposed to look like every other lady in this world looks. 
Sir, you're not supposed to play the same thump that everybody in this world plays. You're not supposed to have the same motive behind why you do what you do as the rest of the world does. Somebody moved into your life. Somebody has changed you and somebody has now given you appetites that are different than this world. And we are called to be spiritually righteous people before the Lord, but not self-righteous people. You know, we always preach out Matthew 23, and that's a great passage to preach out of. And in Matthew 23, the Lord lamb blasts the Pharisees. Boy, we like that. We like it that he's lamb blasting them Pharisees. But do you know how the Lord starts the message off? The Lord starts the message off in Matthew 23, verse 3, and he says this, All therefore whatsoever they, the Pharisees, all therefore whatsoever they bid you observe that observe and do it wasn't what the Pharisees was doing that was wrong they were fasting fasting's a good thing to do they were dressing right dressing right's a good thing to do they were tithing hey can I get a Baptist amen tithing's a good thing to do they'd go to the house of God every time they were supposed to that's a good thing to do the problem was it said he said, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. They did everything they did to be seen of men. The Bible, Jesus said it like this. He said, you're that kind that whitewashes the outside of the sepulcher and makes the outside look good, but inside you're full of dead men's bones, extortion and excess. And Jesus didn't criticize them for having the outside clean. That's where we get messed up. That's where we run to extremes one way or the other. We say, well, see, it don't matter what the outside looks like. Jesus did not say that. Jesus said, get the inside fixed first so that the outside also may be clean. Jesus never advocated nor abdicated an idea that you should be clean inside and just look like you want to outside. But he also never abdicated the idea that you could just be what you wanted to be outside and then what you want to be look good outside but not look good inside. Spiritual righteousness is fine. Self-righteousness stinks in the nostrils of God. If there's one thing that I want to be, it's this, I want to be real. I don't want to be some self-righteous Pharisee. I want to be the same here as I am anywhere else. I'm not trying to be something to impress you. If you don't like me, I'm sorry, but I am what I am. If I'm watching a ball game, I act kind of like this. When I'm preaching, I act like this. When I play games, I act like this. <laughs> I want to be real in my life as I live for the Lord. Let me show you three things about the sin of self-righteousness. What does the sin of self-righteousness do? Number one, listen to me, number one, it makes you think you deserve better. It makes you think you deserve better. Look what he said in chapter 31. Watch what he said in chapter 31, verse number 35. 31, 35, makes you think you deserve better. Watch what he said in 31, 35. Oh, that one would hear me exclamation point behold my desire is that the almighty would answer me and that mine adversary he's talking about the Lord he thinks the Lord is his adversary and that mine adversary had written a book surely I would take it upon my shoulder bind it as a crown to me I would declare unto him the number of my steps as a prince, would I go near unto him? You see what he's saying? He's saying if God would show up right now, I'd tell him how I've been ordering my steps. I'd tell him how clean I've been living and how I don't deserve what he has allowed to come into my life. You say, I don't think that's what he's saying. Oh, that's exactly what he's saying. You ought to look at chapter 13. I'll just flip over there and read it to you. If you go there quick, you can read it with me. Chapter 13 and verse number 3. Job says this in 13.3. He said, Surely I would speak to the Almighty and I desire to reason with God. You get those two passages that I've just read here together. This is what Job's saying. Job's saying, I wish the Lord would show up 
I want to tell him how unjustly things are going in my life. I deserve better because I've been helping the fatherless and the widows because I've been sacrificing because I've been worshiping because I've been raising my children right because I've been giving because I've been keeping my eyes right Joe matter of fact said one thing that's great he said I've made a covenant with mine eyes why should I look upon a maid he said I ain't even been looking at filth and trash I ain't even let it get in my heart and he's telling the truth he hasn't that's wonderful but he's saying man because I do this and this and this and this and because I don't do this and this and this this shouldn't be happening to me I should never go through sorrow like I'm going through I should never go through burdens like I'm going through I should never go through hurt and heartache like I'm going through come on now let's just take our little self righteous mask off and let's just be honest tonight there's been times in all of our life that the Lord has sovereignly and providentially allowed things to come and sweep us off our feet and maybe you didn't vocalize it in a testimony service because you want everybody in the church to think that you're more righteous than what you really are then maybe you never vocalized it to a sister on a phone call or to a brother on a text message but down in your heart you look toward heaven and said God I've been going to that church down there I've been passing out tracks I've been living for God I've been serving the Lord why did you let this happen to me why did you allow this to come upon me God I deserve better than what I'm getting why because of how I've been living I'm just, look, look! I'll be honest with you. When at four years old, my son got a Wilms tumor and cancer and had to be cut from his navel to his side and his left kidney taken out with that tumorous can or that cancerous tumor, and and six months of chemotherapy every week. Go preach Sunday morning, Sunday night. Uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night. Come home on Thursday. Go get chemo on Friday. Leave out again on Saturday. I'm telling you, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I thought to myself, Lord, I don't deserve this. Here I am, Brother Christian, running around the country preaching the Bible, trying to help God's people, trying to live for the Lord, living clean, living right, hadn't been living like a dirty devil. And Lord, here you allow this to happen to me. I deserve better. C can I just say this to you? Who are you? And why do you think that you deserve better than some of the greatest Christians that's ever worn shoe leather? Why do you think that somehow you are spiritually superior to the Apostle Paul, who the greatest Christian of the New Testament sold out to live for Jesus, and yet that Christian man said, thrice I was beaten with rods, five times I received 40 lashes, save one. I've been in three shipwrecks. A night and the day I've been in the deep. Perils here and perils there and perils yonder. I mean, Paul's got... You, you think you deserve better than Paul? Somehow we read these stories in the Bible about Daniel in a lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in a fiery furnace. We read these stories of these great people of God and we even forget that all of the apostles except John the Beloved and not because they didn't try to kill him but because God providentially saved his life. But all of the apostles were mercilessly murdered, tortured, crucified on crosses burned at the stake stabbed and, and hung up by hooks till they died I mean all of them died these is God's hand picked people and yet somehow as American Christians we come to the conclusion that if my air conditioner ain't working in my house if my car starts knocking if I don't have enough money in the bank account to go get a McDonald's hot dog hamburger if I, if I don't have all the comforts of home if I don't have everything just going right if my health ain't just right if my life ain't just right then somehow I'm God's red headed stepchild I'm God's whipping post and I deserve better can I say this evening y'all we're all getting a lot better than we deserve I'll just be honest with you tonight I know who I am and what I am and if I got what I deserve tonight I should, hallelujah if I got what I deserve I sure wouldn't be standing here in a suit and a tie and a nice pair of shoes preaching the Bible to you people if I 
and what I deserve, God would drop me down in the hot spot of hell to spend eternity. Here I sit tonight with Jesus in my heart and Bible in my hand and heaven's my home. God's my father. Jesus is my savior. I'm getting a whole lot better than what I deserve tonight. And so are you. In spite of all the burdens, in spite of the problems, we're reaping a whole lot better than what we deserve. Oh, yeah. Sometimes I'll be praying and I'll get in a pity party and think I deserve better and the Lord will remind me, Zorn, I've been real good to you. Saved your soul, washed your sins away, give you heaven. I'd say we're way ahead of where we ought to be at. But self-righteousness, the sin of self-righteousness will get you to the place where you get mad at God and think, God, I don't deserve this. What we don't deserve is to be sitting where we're sitting tonight. What we don't deserve is the good blessings of God on our life tonight. And God is much, much better to us than what we deserve. I got to hurry. I got to hurry. We see not only will self-righteousness make you think you deserve better, but self-righteousness will make you start despising others. Self-righteousness will get you to the place where you start despising others. Can I make this disclaimer and say this statement? There's a lot of disclaimers you have to make when you preach a message like this. But can I say this disclaimer? You can despise sin without despising people. You can hate sin without hating people. Now, I know the world, the world doesn't understand this because the world comes into churches like this and here's your pastor and here's some of the rest of you men, Brother Christian or Brother Jordan or some of the rest of you men stand up and thunder the Bible and preach against sin. And when you preach against sin, you have to talk about the people that commit the sins. Preach against that and they think, well, you just hate everybody. No, I hate sin. I hate what it does in people's lives. doesn't mean I hate people. I just say this, and I'm going to get to where I'm headed with this point right here, but I, I tell our folk all the time, I want everyone, everyone that comes through the doors of Bible ministry, I want everyone to feel welcome. I don't care what they look like. I don't care what they got on or what they don't got on. I don't care what color their hair is, what length their hair is, what, what their dress looks like or what the dress don't look like. It doesn't matter to me. I don't care what color they are. It don't, I don't care. I'll shake everybody's hand. Brother, I've had so many people come in, messed up from the floor up. I'm talking about homosexuals come in. I've had drunks come in with liquor on their breath, folk on meth and messed up in their mind. You say, what do you do? I walk up, shake their hand, hug their neck, say, I'm glad to have you a Bible missionary, Baptist church. Sit down, enjoy the service, make yourself at home. <laughs> I want everybody to feel welcome. Welcome, but mark this down. I don't want everyone to feel comfortable. There's a difference. I want everybody to be welcome. But if you can walk in the back doors, living in sin, and outside the bounds of the Word of God, I hope you feel so uncomfortable that you either run to an altar and get right, or you hit the back door. Amen. It'll make you start despising others. We're going to get back to Job, because that's what Job does. But hold your place in Job and go with me to Luke 18. Luke 18. Talking about the sin of self-righteousness. It'll make you start despising others. Watch what Jesus says about this subject. Jesus has a lot to say about this subject. Watch what Jesus says in Luke chapter 18, verse number 9. Luke 18, 9. The Bible said, He spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. It'll make you start despising others, the self-righteous. Watch verse 10. Watch what it says. Two men went up into the temple to pray. That's a great thing to do. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. Nothing wrong with that. There's some Pharisees that get right with God. Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, praise the Lord. There's some publicans that get right with God. Praise the Lord. Here's where the problem is, verse 11. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. <laughs> this is, is going to be a really self-righteous prayer. He's praying it for the benefit of self. Yeah, watch what he says. God, I thank thee. If he'd have stopped right there, 
it had been the greatest prayer of the New Testament. Some people ought to cut their prayers off a whole lot shorter than they do. God, I thank thee. That would have been a great prayer, wouldn't it? If he just said, God, thank you. Oh, thank you. Man, that would have been great. That ain't where he stopped at. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, talking about to make you start despising others, or even as this guy right here, <laughs> even as this publican, I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. It's all about self. And the publican standing afar off, evidently they're close enough together that they could probably hear each other. Because, I mean, he says, I'm not like this guy. The publican standing afar off would not so much as lift up his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Can I tell you, it's your job to abase yourself, and it's God's job to exalt you. But if you insist on doing God's job for him, God will do your job for you. <laughs> Did you catch that? You keep trying to exalt yourself, that's God's job. Then God will do your job. He'll bring you down. I'd rather abase myself than God abase me. Because I've, I've done both. I've abased myself and I've had God abase me. It ain't never fun when God has to stick your nose in the dirt and rub it around. It ain't never fun. And here in the text we find that this Pharisee, he despises others because he thinks he's so much more righteous than they are. I'm glad that he's not an extortioner. I'm glad he's not unjust or a publican. I'm glad he's fasting. I'm glad he's giving tithes. But listen to me. That has nothing to do with what the publican's doing. Let the publican do what he's doing. You just thank God for what God's doing in your life, sir. Y'all listen to me. I'm talking about despising others. I don't know about you. I don't know about you. But I'm a red-blooded American man like the rest of you dudes are. If I come to the altar tonight, and I'm down here praying and all of a sudden one of you fellas comes up and you're standing right over here next to me and you say Lord thank you God that you've been good to me and Lord thank you that I'm not like Cody Zorn God that dude right there he is the worst preacher I've ever heard God I'm telling you I almost just want to take strychnine while I listen to him preach God I can't stand him God he is the sorriest low down good for nothing that's rotten a scoundrel on the, and I hear you saying that I'm going to probably be like hey I'm right here. I can hear you. No doubt the publican can hear what this guy's saying. But he doesn't even respond. Why? I mean, listen to me. Here's why. This is tying back to Job now. We ain't left Job. This is tying back to Job. Why didn't he respond? Because he doesn't look at himself as being super righteous. He looks at himself as just an old sinner that needs mercy. Y'all listen to me. You know what the whole book of Job is? For the most part, up until chapter 32, it is simply a back and forth between a bunch of self-righteous people. Do you know why? The, the book could have been so much shorter. The book of Job could have been so much more condensed if after Job's friends started saying things about him like the Pharisee did about the publican, if Job would have just said, you know what, I'm just an old sinner. God be merciful to me. But Job couldn't help himself. Because he's so stinking self-righteous, every time they point an accusing finger at him and say, you're this, that, and the other, Job's self-righteousness wells up in him and he says, I ain't neither. I'll tell you what I've been doing and I'll tell you how much I know and I'll tell you how much I've been serving God. Let me tell you about me. And then they shoot at him again and Job can't help it. He, that ain't true. He, he constantly has to defend his self-righteousness. And self-righteousness will get you to the place where you'll start despising others because you think you're so good. You know what Job finally even tells his buddies? Job tells his buddies this. He said, my father would not have even let your fathers keep his dogs. 
For he, thought, he said, my fathers would have disdained you and wouldn't let you keep the dogs out that keep the flock. I mean, he just cuts them down. I, I'm better than y'all are. It'll make you start despising others. We, we go street preaching. I, I don't know if you do or not. It doesn't, it, it, you know, that's that's the, the personal preference of each church. Some churches focus a lot on door knocking. Some focus more on street ministry. Some focus on bus ministry. I just think you ought to get the gospel out ever how you choose to get it out. It's fine by me. And, and we go street preaching and take our young boys street preaching. And a lot of times, because street preaching is a confrontational ministry, we don't go out there trying to tell people you're this or you're that. We go tell them Jesus saves and Jesus died for you. And if you'll come to Christ, he'll save you. But people still look at our ministry and they think, you're just trying to act like you're better than we are. No, we don't. I'm trying to tell you about a Savior that can change your life. I don't think I'm better than anybody in this place tonight. I am the lowest of the low this evening. But self-righteousness will make you start despising others. Self-righteousness will make you think you deserve better. But then lastly, let me say this. Lastly, I'm done. Self-righteousness will make you get discovered by God. <laughs> self-righteousness will make you get discovered by God. Look it back with Job with me if you would, and let's, let's see when the Lord shows up. What's going to settle all this? The Lord showing up. Elihu challenges Job's words in chapter 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, and 37. But the Lord's going to show up in chapter 38. It's like when a bunch of kids has been arguing, fussing and fighting, and mama or daddy walks into the room. All right, the argument's over. Everybody listen, youngins. That's what God's fixing to do. Watch what fixes it. Chapter 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Job, you wanted God to come down. You're going to get your wish, big boy. Job, you want to tell God how great you are and how right you are and how holy you are? Here's your shot, pal. And the Lord said, Who is this? <laughs> uh, I'm the perfect man. The upright man. Remember the one that fears God and eschews evil? Who are you? He doesn't even call him by his name. Who are you? <laughs> Y'all, when we stack ourselves up to the Lord... Who are we? Right. Who am I? He said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Who hath laid the cornerstone thereof? So I mean, brother... The Lord, when the Lord said, can you imagine the scene? Here they've been down here in this dust heap, this ash heap, and they've just been arguing back and forth, just this piddly ante arguing back and forth of how righteous they all are. And all of a sudden, this booming voice that's louder than Niagara Falls ten times over, the voice of the Lord that thunders in the heavens and thunders on the waters, all of a sudden, this booming voice comes flying from the nebulas and star clusters, flying out of the third heaven, and lands right in the middle of this Middle Eastern dusty spot beside the road and God booms and says who is this you say I bet Job gave him an earful didn't he bet Job told him Job been saying I wish he'd show up I got something to say let's look at the first time Job opens his mouth after the Lord shows up chapter 40 verse number 3 here's the first time Job talks after the Lord has showed up Chapter 40, verse 3. Then, I, then Job answered the Lord and said, I'm glad you showed up because I've been wanting to give you a piece of my mind, sir. No, this is what Job says. Behold, I am vile. Wait. Y'all, yeah. this is Job chapter 40, verse number 3. 
That's the first time Job has spoken since he gave those 83 personal possessive pronouns in chapter 31. In chapter 31, not 10, 15 minutes ago, he's been saying, I this... I that wish he'd show up. I want to tell him something. I'd order my steps. I'm a prince. Let me tell him what I've been doing. That's the last thing he said until here. And then now he shows up and says, I'm vile. What shall I answer thee? Verse 4, I will run on him I'll lay my hand upon my mouth. Once have I spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. Surely that's good enough for the Lord, right? <laughs> now even a light back in on the old boy again. <laughs> I'm telling you, self-righteousness is such a subtle sin and such a despicable sin that the Lord has to keep on rooting it. Self-righteousness is so embedded in our heart, we think we're right. I'm right. I'm right. And God has to keep. <clears throat> I think my heart's right. Your heart's deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. You can't even know it. Let me keep on scraping that thing. That's why we keep reading our Bible. That's why we keep praying. That's why we keep getting preaching. Because every time we think we've gotten to that level where I'm right. Boy, I've got there. God starts showing us, you ain't, you ain't right keep scraping the Lord answers him again verse 6 Job's just said what more do you want out of the guy he said he's vile he said he won't answer no more then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said gird up now thy loins like a man we're not done I will demand of thee declare thou unto me wilt thou also disannul my judgment wilt thou condemn with me that thou mayest be righteous Job you think you're more right than I am you think you can tell me how to be God? <laughs> y'all so spiritual, y'all ain't even got a clue what I'm talking about tonight. But I'm telling you, there's been times where I thought I could have told the Lord how to do His job, Brother Ernie, a little better than what He was doing it. I know, I know, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so sorry y'all got such a poor evangelist this week. Such a sorry, low-down, rotten evangelist that he would literally stand up here and tell you that there are times in his life where he thought he could instruct the Lord and tell the Lord how to do things better. But I, I, I'll go home after tonight if you want me to, Brother Doug. I'm sorry. But I have. There have been times in my life I thought, Lord, you should have done it this way. Lord, you should have done it that way. You know what will get our hearts right? You know what will get us to the place where the self-righteousness gets rooted out? It's when we see the Lord. You know what, what got Job? Listen to me, y'all. Please listen to me. What got Job to the point where he finally said, I'm vile, I don't have nothing to answer? What got Job to the place where he finally said in chapter 42, verse 6, I abhor myself, repent, and dust and ashes? Listen to me. It wasn't Eliphaz. It wasn't Elihu. It wasn't his buddies. It wasn't all of them. I'll tell you what finally got him right when he saw the Lord when he saw the Lord when he heard the Lord when he saw how high he was when he saw how holy he was when he saw how wonderful he was can I tell you what will root out the self righteousness out of our heart if we get our eyes off our brother and get our eyes off our sister and get our eyes off ourselves and look toward the hills from whence cometh our help when Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up he said what Woe is me. When Peter saw the Lord, he said, Depart from me. I'm a sinful man, O Lord. And when I see the Lord, when I see Jesus, when I see how wonderful he is, when I see how holy he is, when I see how high he is, I have to hang my head and say, What a mighty God! What a righteous God! What a holy God! What a worm I am! What a worthless individual I am! What a wonderful God! God he is I think the reason why sometimes we think we deserve better and we start despising others is because all of our life we focus this way comparing you to me me to you and instead if we'd all come to church and say oh, you know the end of the church service 
would end up being like the end of Job every service. You say, what's the end of the church service of Job? Here's the end of Job's church service. I repent. Lord, I'm sorry. It didn't matter how right you thought you was coming in. Lord, I'm sorry. And then you know what else Job did? Job and his buddies got right with each other. You know what seeing the Lord will do? It'll get us right with God, and it'll get us right with each other. You know why we stay wrong with each other? Because we think we're right. I'm right. But when all of a sudden we all get before the Lord and we see we're all wrong. <laughs> I'm wrong, you're wrong, they're we're all wrong compared to him. We end up getting right. No, Job winds up, listen to me. I'm talking about getting to the place where God gets the whole thing right. Job's been telling God, you've done it wrong. You ain't done it right. And tonight you might have walked in and said, Lord, why'd you do it this way? The sister sung the song. Mary and Martha. You've messed up, Jesus. Isn't that what she sung tonight? Last night, sister sung the heart song. I preached on the heart. This night, tonight, sister sings about two girls that tell the Lord how to do his job. If you'd have been here, I'm telling you, you ain't right. I'm right. If you'd have been here. No, let me show you. I'm going to make it so much better than you ever thought it could be. And by the end of Job, you know what God does? God blesses him two times over. God blesses him twice as much. And God gives him the three most beautiful daughters in all the land. And God gives him seven more sons. And God gives him double for his trouble. And brother, somewhere down the road, Job looked back on his life 140 years later. And you know what I think Job finally said? Job finally said, Lord, your ways are higher than my ways. Lord, you're right and I'm wrong. God, you've done it right. Look what what God has done <laughs> and can I tell you this I'm through I'm through and I'm going to turn it over to the preacher I think after this the Bible said after this Job lived 140 years preacher Foster I think after this Job kept doing everything he said he had been doing he didn't start committing adultery he didn't start letting his eyes look at things he shouldn't have didn't stop helping his friends all the things after this that Job had been doing brother Jeff he kept on doing them he kept living right he kept sacrificing he kept going to the place of worship but listen to me but now please don't miss this I'm done but now when he goes to his place of worship now he helps his neighbor now when he sacrifices it's a whole different heart behind it now when he does it, he says, I'm not doing this so that people can think Job's good. And I'm not doing this so I can get a pat on the back or so I can think anybody can think I'm righteous. Lord, I'm doing it because you've been so good to me. God, you're so right and you're so holy that God, I'm doing it just because I love you. See, tonight we ought to live right and do right. But we're to have the right heart behind why we're doing all that. And tonight, maybe if we just see the Lord. The choir sung it right. The choir sung it right. He's answered prayers I've prayed for years. Never once has He failed me. He made a way when all I saw. This is Job singing. Was impossibility. My heart bows in worship. My lips sing His praise. We will choose to serve the Lord for the rest of all our days. God woke me up this morning. This is Job singing. With blessings untold, a faithful loving family in a house that we call home, the promise of eternal life because of Calvary. A peace that's settled in my heart since the day he saved me. And Job would say, Look what God, not me, look what God has done. I stand amazed to think of his love. I don't deserve it. There's no way I could earn it. 
and eternity will not be enough to thank God for all he's done. God help us tonight to let the Lord and his word and the Holy Ghost root out that self-righteousness. I, I, I find it creeping up all the time in my life. And I constantly need the Lord to do a work on my heart. Could we see him tonight? Let's all stand this evening. Preacher, you come, Father. Thank you for your word. Oh, you said it's not my word like as a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Did You said oh, my word's like a fire. Lord, you said the word of God. It's quick and powerful. It pierces to the mind of son of soul, spirit, joints, and marrow. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Lord, so many times I approach your book and I think I'm right and I think everything's fine. And all of a sudden your word shows me I'm not nearly where I need to be. God, I pray tonight we'd take self-examination. Help us to see the Lord high and lifted up. Be like Job and repent in dust and ashes. In Jesus' name, amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.